Hi there, Glocal Citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. I'm your host, Florence Adu, and I'm back with part two of my conversation with Joy Namunonga. Joy is a Ugandan based in Kampala, Uganda. She has over a decade of experience in program management, research, public policy, civic technology, community engagement, and anti-corruption advocacy. She is an expert on governance and social accountability. Her work has resulted in strengthening Uganda's health systems, supply chain, and enhancing information flow and transparency for Uganda's system of electronic open data records. Joy is definitely one to watch. She's currently an advocacy officer in governance and social accountability at Action Aid International. So please do Listen in for part two of my conversation with Joy. So speaking of being outside of your hometown, this yeah. is where I ask my global speak questions. So we want to hear what you hear. So I ask my guests to share a word, a phrase, or saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you came to value it as global speak. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. My mantra, I have two mantras and I've been repeating one, which came from my mom, Joy Kai is just the beginning. So whenever I'll be challenged, Ah, yeah, that is always my favorite mantra. And a second mantra I always apply is that if we women do not create our own future, no one shall guarantee it for us. So my mom told me those words as she was trying to sell the goods we had so that Joy gets an education. So whenever I'm even mm-hmm. with communities, I have that I have that soft eye for making sure that women are part of every part of my work, even if it's governance, communities, advocacy. I really want to see that part of we women do not create our own future. Nobody shall do it for us. So those are my favorite mantras. I mix them up mm-hmm. and I roll myself and get working. Of course, you know, governance, just like any other work, you have to be fast. Sometimes you're disappointed. There are times when you really follow up a corruption scandal, and at the end of the day, government ends up exonerating the people involved. But after knowing that they are guilty, you're knowing that this is not right. I just wake up, stand and look at myself in the mirror, and I just tell myself, you know what, Joy? You got this. Let's get rolling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, disappointments. Right. Sometimes you drive while you're crying. Right. But, and you're like, I'm crying, but what are the communities who are affected thinking? How are we going to change this? Mm-hmm. Right? What things have made me mm-hmm. keep going? Keep going. Right. So, right, of yeah. course. Of course. Mm-hmm. So I was still talking about my journey. I left on the Corruption Coalition Uganda. That was in 2016. And I joined Sunlight Foundation. That was in Washington, D.C. So in Sunlight Sunlight Foundation, I was a policy fellow. And still how I I got that opportunity (laughs) was through like applying, doing TOEFL, and I was funded by the U.S. Department of State. So I was in okay. D.C., okay. and that's where I learned how they were using technology to make government more accessible and transparent. And most of my work was on looking at America's influence abroad, bribery, how they get influenced in other people's governance processes, either it's transparently or non-transparently. Then I was looking at the hedge funds. By the time I was in D.C., that's when the Trump and Hillary <laughs> campaigns we are going on. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So I was mainly looking at election financing. How is funding the elections? How does it influence the policies of a specific party? And I had to learn a lot. And I told myself, I have to take technology back home in Uganda. So when I was in DC, much I was following up the money, dark money politics and the Wall Streets and everything, I had to design something called Fix My Community. Um, And Fix My Community, 
I was looking at how technology can help communities to report. I looked at my community-based monitoring system in Karamoja and how communities were working on foot to report corruption. Yet in the United States, they were staying in the comfort of their homes to report corruption. I was like, can't this work back home? Much as they can't use smartphones, isn't there any way I can bring it back home in Uganda so that communities can report using technology and government can access their complaints using a system? I was supported by some good institutions which believed in me, one being the National Democracy Institute, then the Sunlight mm-hmm. Foundation itself helped so much to come up with the design features. But I was really, really supported by the engine room. It believed in my cause, whereby when I applied for their funds, I was one of the three partners who are taken from Africa. One was from uh, Nigeria, then me, and Sierra Leone. So Fix My Community started kicking off. When we came back home, because I designed it in the United States, very many things had to change in terms of context, the environment, because in Uganda, not everybody is safe. Unlike America, when they have the freedom of expression, when they talk about corruption, they are listened to. Some of our people disappear miraculously because they've talked about someone's daughter who was involved in corruption. So we had to look at the security of Uganda's terrain. We had to look at Uganda Communication Commission giving us a short code. If it was going to, re- to be reporting about gender-based violence, that short code would be easy to be accessed. But just because it was about corruption, it became hard to give me a short code, communities to come and start reporting corruption. Way forward, I got support from the US Embassy. They really came in handy because I was their alumni. I was able to get a short code, but the project was denied to be implemented in Karamoja. That was one of the setbacks I got. We had to go so back why, to the drawing board with the engine. Why, yeah. Just to, not to cut you, why did you think that they denied it? Because if I was using traditional methods of reporting and very many corruption cases were coming from Karamoja daily, what would happen mm-hmm. if they were given the power of a mobile phone to report corruption from their houses? So it was going to expose mm-hmm. them that big. And of course, I was trying to scratch where mm-hmm. someone was earning a living. Right. It really brought every yeah. opportunity for that project to be there. Right. So That's the I crux didn't give this up. End. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't give up. I had to now look for ways, for wings, on how to implement this project. So I realized that DFID, Department of Financial Development for UK, was implementing some technology projects with government. So I had to partner with them in order to make sure that I don't get a new short code, but I use their system. Mm, so okay. it was possible to add on a few design features so that Fix My Community could see the light of the day. I convinced the Ministry of Health, I convinced Education, but Ministry of Health was supportive so that they can be able to track absenteeism, to track the medicine going to health centers. For them, they welcome this. Other ministries refused it. So whereas I had designed Mm. Fix My Committee to look at corruption in all sectors, I ended up with health. We went back to the design, yeah, and I started looking at Uganda's health system supply chain, how Mm. they allocate money for medicine, who is responsible, who gets what money, which hospital gets the medicine, who delivers the medicine to a specific health center, who signs for that medicine. So my system was able to track all those steps in a timely manner. So in case a medicine vehicle for cars was leaving Entebbe, going to Iganga, that is in eastern Uganda, the system would notify us about the time it's leaving and when the medicine was delivered. And now people in the community would let us know who was signed for the medicine. So in case there were some administrative errors, that's how medicine is stolen in Uganda, through administrative errors. People ask for Panadol, for Paracetamol, they're given gloves <laughs> instead. But the system is showing that Panadol left. After when you report, they say there are administrative errors. So our system was able to track a lot of administrative errors and National Medical Stores was able to come up with a form for tracking the errors and also to address them on time. 
But when the year went on with the engine room, I remember the era stopped. They started producing. Afterwards, I got a partnership from the University of Chicago, Harris Public Policy School. So they gave me some of their students to come and do a tool audit in Uganda. And they were looking at the government and civic society, as well as the health system supply chain. So much as they're helping to research on Uganda's terrain and technology, we also discovered that also a lot of corruption was happening in government in the name of using technology to accelerate their work. Mm. We gave a, a very good example, which is all over internet, was a project called MTRAC, M-T-R-A-C, MTRAC, where over 16.5 billion US dollars were funded to just do a technology tool <laughs> for people to wow. report. Yeah, to report incidences and disease outbreaks. However, the system was never developed, but the money was being used for launching and celebrating the project. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> we went to yeah. the community. Yeah, when we went to the communities, the doctors told us, you know, they just came here and they told us how to log in into the system, but we don't know its name. But just because we had done the research. It was showing us how now corruption was being now a way of life, even in, in supporting government to improve their services. When we looked at, we looked at even very many donors working with government institutions to support them with technology audits and technology tools, but such tools would not spend, have a, would not have sustainability. Well, for civic society, the tools are still in existence. In case they are closing, they are just archived. So, so that when someone comes up and wants to use Joyce Fix My Community, I can just give them the user rights and continue. For government, that was not the case. So the tool audit really unmasked a lot of things. However, it also helped us to get a partnership with the Minister of Health, Health Management Information System, where they were now welcoming all that data from civil civic society as regards to the sector and how they can improve to just go straight into their health management information system. Why we celebrate that milestone is that data comes straight from the community, it goes to the system, and it informs policies. And I'm happy right now that it is still going on. The Minister of Health is even having a quarterly health working group where we stakeholders go to make input as we get to that data, how we can improve. So it has that big mouth stakeholder approach, but it all started from Karamoja, me going to DC, then a project being stopped from being implemented to a place I really loved it to go. And mm -hmm. efforts are still ongoing. And today I'm working with Action Aid Uganda after my Sunlight Foundation journey. And I'm working mainly with local governments, revenue enhancement. I'm looking at how local governments can be able to mobilize resources without looking at donors, without looking at central government. How can we sure. mobilize locally in order to fund services when will Africa stop begging? So that's what I'm working on right now. And I'm using the local economic development approach. For instance, I'm implementing in 18 districts in Uganda. I look at a place like Gulu. Right now it has been made a city. Before it wasn't a city. But I had to tell them, you have very many tourist sites, historical sites of slavery where they would kill Africans. Can't we make such places tourism sites? If there are tourism sites, where does the money go? That money can go to building markets for the local people. So a local person in the market will be able and happy to pay a tax, knowing that a tax is helping to construct a toilet in the market. A tax is helping mm -hmm. the local leaders right now to fund their own healthcare workers. Before, all the healthcare workers used to be funded by the central government. But right now, I'm happy to say that the local governments are able to finance some, not all, but some of their health workers. So in case there is a deficit, there is a way they can use the money in order to facilitate their service delivery. So using the local economic development approach, I just told them, can you look at what you have in order to improve your communities? I'm seeing them coming up with games 
There is another a game which happened last year. It was a soccer game. They had to invite in Gulu, they had to invite people from other districts to come and attend the match. But guess what? They invested like two million, but the chief administrative officer told us that he was able to collect 20 million. So in that 20 oh, wow. million, yeah. I was happy. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, in the 20 million, I have to go back to the community and I tell them what the 20 million is doing. So I'm bringing the civic society way of accounting and pushing it on the government side. So whenever they collect taxes quarterly, they have to come up and tell the communities what the taxes are doing. Some of them are partnering with movie makers like Forest Waitaka and Gulu are having mm -hmm. a partnership. So they gave him some yeah. old buildings. He improved them. After improving them, he leased them out. But now Gulu is happy because the buildings were dilapidated. He has come up and improved the structures. And the structures are giving mm -hmm. Gulu taxes and the taxes are improving the people. That's what I've been doing mm -hmm. for the last two years. But to empower, to, to make sure that we support them, I designed even revenue mapping registers for them. Then I created a mm. award. Yeah, so every year we have what we call the Integrity Awards to recognize men and women in public service who have served diligently with communities and mm -hmm. without corruption. So communities have mm -hmm. been able to vote their own leaders. They vote transparently right. and tell us the reasons why they are voting them. And last year what stood out... Yeah. The person That's did, a great solution. Yeah, yeah. So the person who won last year was a chief administrative officer of one of the areas I'm working in. And one of the things the communities were talking about was improved roads. He's transparent. He tells us what our money is doing. Our health centers have medical workers. And I was like, okay, now local economic development is working. So now mm -hmm. the hit that we are having is that now central government is seeing that local governments are mobilizing resources it has started giving them budget projections. So what it means is that if district called A is projecting to collect 700 million and it collects 1.5 billion, what the central government does, it tells the district to get the surplus and takes it back to the center. It has really mm. hurt, yes, it has really hurt community. And up now the leaders are asking what is our money doing because central government was supposed to give us money. We've come up with our own initiatives. And right now, after collecting our money painfully, central government is taking over the money. I realized that, ministry, the, um, the, um, I realized that local governments were like a child of every ministry. They are falling in finance. They are falling in mm -hmm. office of the president. So I had to advocate for the local government sector. I wanted them to have their own independent sector, which can ask for their own money from the national budget, which can be able to control even their own decisions. Whereas the, the central government, especially the, the cabinet, was able to give the local government a sector last year, it has not kick-started their work. Mm -hmm. And right now what I'm working on is to make sure that the sector gets the sufficient resources in order to work with local government. But still, as someone who's passionate about corrupt anti-corruption and policies, I'm making sure that also some of the funds go to having anti-corruption committees in specific districts. Because there is having a sector, we start advocating for money and we get money from the national budget. And someone within the district is using the money to buy sofa seats, is using the money to buy land. So we are yeah. still agreeing on the terms of references before starting to advocate for funding of that sector. That's where I am. <laughs> Over to you from there. Such exciting work you're doing, and it's really making impact, which is very encouraging, particularly, I think, in the context of Ugandan government and structure. I think that you being able to have these dialogues is you know, with, with our, I'm not sure if, if all of our listeners kind of have the context of Uganda, but it can be a very contentious political environment, you know. So in your experience working between local governments 
and the central government. You already mentioned some of the gender issues. What are some of the other challenges politically that you've had to face? Like, you know, media, anything like that, that stands in your way and how have you overcome them? Yeah, for media, from day one, media has been my friend. Media has been my fault, my okay. friend. Yeah, because I always share with them information. And whenever I would go maybe to investigate the cases, I will make sure media is involved. For the local government, what I've decided to do, whenever they are going for sport visits, I introduce what they call sport visits. So sport visits have members of civil society. They have members of local government and media. So if we are going to monitor a place called A, we move as a collective group. You don't go as an individual and you give us your report. We all have to be right. there and interpret and rewrite the facts. Now, it's kind of tricky mm-hmm. when it comes to the central government where everybody's trying to protect their job. I've seen it in even the committees mm-hmm. I was running. Mm-hmm. Central government people are, are really, it's more of patronage as compared yes. to public service. If I speak about this, I'm mm-hmm. going to lose it friends in government who even call me to tell me, Joy, this is happening. Since you're in civil society, you can talk about it. You can advocate about it. And they give me all the information so that I can be able to speak with media mm. because for me, I'm a neutral arbiter. So that is a very big challenge. Sure. It's not that those men and women are not educated, but they need their jobs. And in case they stand up, against government, they're going to lose their jobs. And everybody in Uganda is kind of expensive. Another biggest hurdle in my kind of work is policy implementation. Mm-hmm. When you look at the global international reports year in and year out, Uganda has mm-hmm. some of the best laws in Africa. We score so well when mm-hmm. it comes to Over 80% is our score. When it comes to implementation, we are at 49% and every year we are dropping down. So whereas we have these very many good laws, I participated in the amendment of the Anti-Corruption Act where we are even supposed to take away property of a spouse of someone involved in corruption. But up to now, I've never seen that property being taken. Yeah. Yeah. So and uh, the hardest part comes to appointing the appointment of heads of key institutions supposed to challenge corruption is done by the president. So how are they going to stand mm. up him? When I look at the office of the inspectorate of government, which is the lead in investigating and prosecuting cases, guess what? The person who's supposed to head it is the president. And when you look at civil society reports, they say there is no political will when it comes to fighting corruption. Most of the scandals which are coming up, including one recent one in the United States, all around the first family. But how is the inspector of government going to prosecute mm-hmm. some cases? Mm-hmm. And right now I'm speaking, as I'm speaking, the, the inspector of government left her job in July 2020, and we never had a new one up to now. And what does that imply? Uganda right now is going through elections. Uh, Uganda right now is having very many donations from the developed world as regards to COVID. But Mm -hmm. the inspector of government cannot take on new investigations because they do not have a substantive inspector general of government. Mm. So it's like a trick. Yeah. Yeah. And that, trust me, we do end there without that person in place. And when a new person comes in, where will they start from? From cases of that year. So political gimmicks are very, very common. Mm-hmm. And they're backed up with right. our policies when it comes to the gender question. Most, some of the women we have in these places are just put up in those positions, not because they know what to do, but to get donor funding to see that we are mainstreaming mm-hmm. gender in our development discourse. Mm-hmm. But we're not really putting women's voices at heart. We are not bringing enough women at the transparency and accountability table. For some of them who have participated, they leave the sector with, with anger, with bitterness. Some of them leave the country and they just whistleblow when they've left the country that this and this was happening. 
but it's a very, very big challenge. Sure. When it comes to um, the interfaces between government and civil society, I would say it is really good and healthy. Okay. The main challenge is implementing whatever is planned in those meetings. Remember, some of the things need to go to cabinet, some of them go to parliament, some mm -hmm. of them go to the judiciary, whereas the approval ratings in the judiciary and the parliament is good. When it comes to cabinet commitments, we really never get to achieve a thing. It was last year we had the president pronounce himself on corruption. Of course, we are used to it. He does it every year as a political thing. So when he was mm -hmm. coming these tours of civil society, we were a few civil society agencies and I was luckily invited. When he reached my stall, he asked me, so where do you work? When I told him, he was shaking my hand. He told me, oh, you guys are very nasty. That, that comes from the president. Ah. <laughs> 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 so the people who are moving with him, because he had the director of public prosecution moving with him, he had anti-corrupt agencies moving with him. They're like, no, Joy has done a lot of work when it comes to Uganda's anti-corruption practices. Then she was like, but she doesn't support NRM, that is our ruling party. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't know he was really paying attention to whatever we're doing. I'm happy I'm nasty. Thank you, but um, yeah. I was happy. It didn't really annoy me at all. But I went back to my colleagues, the excellency called me nasty. Yeah. Like, but that's good. <laughs> you, know, you know, you have so much confidence, which is awesome because the next question I was going to ask, do you ever have any fears around retaliation or anything like that? Have you ever faced any of that? Because you're in a very high profile and targeted space because you are in the way of livelihoods. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've just been in the International Anti-Corruption Week. And the International Anti-Corruption Day was ninth. Um, when I was seated in this reflection meeting of civil society and state actors, someone told me, uh, Joy doesn't want to do radio talk shows. Uh, you know, for them, they really wanted to hear more of Joy speaking, uh, Joy here. Mm -hmm. But I had to tell them that, you know what, I entered this sector when I was just 20, and right now I'm in my early 30s, and I'm happy that you're all empowered and you can be able to speak up. Even if I don't mm -hmm. come to speak, I know yeah. that you yeah. guys are going to speak. Oh, and yeah. One thing I noted is that if I continue speaking as Joy, it's very easy to target me. But yes. I've heard what we call frenemies in most of mm -hmm. government entities. And in case yeah. something is going to happen, I get to know. And when I was entering civil society, I remember one of my mentors told me that if you're entering civil society, you have to choose the side you belong on. Are you working for the corporates or you're working with the communities? When you work with mm -hmm. the community, they will stand in for you. And when you're working mm -hmm. with the corporates, they can easily throw you under the bus, the way we yes. say it. So mm -hmm. there are times when the environment is tricky in Kampala. And when, even when I keep quiet on Facebook, like for a week, and someone just comes up and says, Joy, are you okay? You're so quiet. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, well, like, okay. It's very common for people who don't know me to ask me if I'm really okay. The most threat I fear is that my daughter, because I know she goes to schools with some of the people I'm challenging. And she's someone who's really okay. confident. And sometimes I tell her, you know what, you don't have to talk mm -hmm. about this and you leave it to me to talk about it. And no, but they are corrupt. And I'm like, you know what, they can easily target you because you go to school with their kids. That's the only fear I have when it comes to my work. Okay. But I'm okay. thinking, oh, well, maybe in two to three years, I really want to take this to a global level. Okay. Maybe working for, yeah, for the UNCAC, United Nations Coalition Against Corruption. Yeah. In Africa, it's really dormant. And I really want to contribute to that discourse globally. But I want to do it after I finish school because I was accepted in the University of Pennsylvania for 
a master of public administration yes. and yes. I want to pay attention to thank you yeah yeah I want to pay attention yeah to policy implementation and regional how regional regional ratifications can come in to tackle corruption because right now I feel the battle nationally is not moving, it's not shifting, and we don't think the president is going to stand down. I was born in his regime and he's standing even this year. Yeah. So, but when the UN picks up, when those independent mm -hmm. pick up, there's a way he threatened, like today they issued a statement when the US banned some army officials from going to America again. Last year they had to ban others for going to their country or being involved in corruption. There is a way they are shaken and they take some steps backwards. And since they own CAC, the United Nations Coalition Against Corruption in Africa is not that strong. And the African Union most times does not pronounce itself very well when it comes yeah. to corruption. I feel mm -hmm. my contribution will do a great deal. Sometimes I'm disappointed when I see members of the African Union and I don't see women. <laughs> but uh -huh. I, 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 I do. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I feel yeah. there is need for a woman on that table to make things moving. I know men are exactly. good with that, but we go a step further, a step better when we want things to get done. Yes. Sure. Oh, so 